So today we had our lab quiz on diffusion and osmosis. And after the quiz, I want to, I went over in class about a number of things that have to do with the application of some of the things that we have studied in class. So um, here we go. For those of you that were absent today, I want to make sure you have all the information. So um, the first thing we did, and it, this is a miss, mix of a bunch of different things. So no particular order. So here we go. Number one, uh, one of the things I wanted to review is bring to your attention that we have studied carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And one of the things I want you to think about is what elements make each one of these molecules. So if we start with carbohydrates, and you look at all the carbohydrates that you have in your big uh, uh, macromolecules page, you're going to see that all carbohydrates are made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. If you look at your lipids, mostly your fats and cholesterol, not your phospholipids, but the other ones, the most common ones, the fats that we call the triglycerides, you're going to see that all lipids are also made out of CHO, but with very little oxygen very little oxygen. So just take a minute and look at them and you will notice that. Of course, if we are talking about phospholipids, in addition to those, our phospholipids will have phosphorus, so it will be chop. Now, if you look at proteins, you know all the proteins are made of amino acids. An amino acid is a carbon with a carboxyl, hydrogen, R group and your amino group here. If you look at the structure of all the amino acids and you have hundreds of amino acids together making a protein, proteins are going to be made basically of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and don't forget that there are two amino acids that have sulfur, and one of those it happens to be extremely important in the formation of disulfide bonds when you're looking at the tertiary structure of proteins. So here you have your proteins. Now, look at nucleic acids, and you know that your nucleic acids have a phosphate group attached to a 5-carbon sugar, not in the screen, yes, a 5-carbon sugar, and the sugar is attached to a nitrogen base that can be A, D, C, G, or uracil if we're talking about RNA. Now, if you look at the structure of any of these, first is a sugar. Since it's a sugar, you know you're going to have CHO. The nitrogen base, if you look again in your page of all the uh, the molecular structure of your nitrogen base, you're going to see that you have nitrogen, and of course you have phosphorus. So everybody has the basic organic structure, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and then proteins, the nitrogen and the sulfur, and the nucleic acids, the nitrogen and the phosphorus. And this is important because you can use a radioactive tracers, sometimes the sulfur or phosphorus that you put inside your cells, the molecules, these particular ones, pick them up, and then you can trace, for example, if you're talking about radioactive sulfur, you can see where the sulfur is going, and you know that the sulfur is attached to a protein. So it facilitates the process of figuring out what each one of these molecules are doing in your body. So please keep that in mind. Become familiar with the molecular structure. You don't have to memorize it, but you can. You have to recognize these few elements. Right? So that was number one, one of the little things I wanted to uh, hit today. Now, next, I'm going to make this short. I wanted to go over now that uh, you have studied and you have a manipulated uh, water potential, I want to go over some highlights of water potential and mostly application of water potential. So common things that maybe you are not totally aware, 
is the molecules of water that can move, not in this direction anymore, the only thing is molecules of water that are going to be able to move in the opposite direction. So by increasing the pressure here, squeezing, the molecules can move in that direction, even though the concentration is not the correct one. So the message here is by increasing the pressure here, I can move things. And that is why, for water potential, you have the pressure component. Because solute is a factor, and the pressure that we put on the system is an atom. Now, in the lab and in class, we've been working with a system that is open. So we have been ignoring the pressure potential. But if I were able to squeeze this, things would be different. But right now, we are working on an open system. So I just wanted to bring to life basically what solid potential and pressure potential might mean in these kind of situations. Just give you some more concrete examples. So talking about concrete examples, Let's look at a concrete example of how this works and how it's used in real world life. So I'm going to draw you a chamber here with a membrane. And of course, this membrane is going to have very tiny holes, semi-permeable just to water. And in this chamber, I'm going to put seawater. Sea water has a concentration of salt of about 3.5%. 3.5%. So let's pretend that it's all sodium chloride. So this means 3.5 grams of sodium chloride in 100 ml of water. That is what 3.5% means. Sorry, I'm keeping everything scrunched in a little space of the board so I can get it open. So here we have this situation. So we are going to fill this section here with seawater, 3.5% solid chloride. That's the average normal. And what, what I'm going to do, notice there is nothing here. I'm going to put a plunger again or a piston, some kind of structure here, well sealed. And I'm going to push, 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 push. So it's a force that is going to push this piston down. So what is going to happen when the piston comes down and squeezes this? The only thing that can go across this membrane here is water. So only water molecules are going to be crossing over there. And what are we going to have in this other side of the chamber? We are going to have pure, for the most part, pure water. Now, two things to keep in mind. To push, you need to push. And you're not going to have a person pushing. So you usually put a machine or something. So this is going to consume energy. So this is a process that requires energy that pressure. But you get pure water. This is one of the principles how desalinization plants work. This is how you can get fresh water out of ocean water if you live in a country that does not have any fresh water or in a place without very little uh, fresh water. This is one of the mechanisms that you use to desaline, desalinate um, seawater and just make it drinkable. This process that I just described here with the pressure and the water squeezing, this process is called, conveniently, reverse osmosis. And this is what California might need to invest in the future if we continue with the drought problems. And California's problem is our problem because most of the veggies, fresh veggies that we eat in this country, a lot of them, most of them, come from California. So if they don't have water, we don't have veggies. And I want my veggies cheap. So keep in mind this, please. 
this process we can do it. The problem is that it requires energy. And the other problem is as you put the plunger down, this concentration here increases and becomes very salty, briny, and you need to dispose this. So usually the way this is disposed back into the ocean, you cannot dispose it right there on the shoreline because then all the little creatures, all the clams and mussels and things that live in the shoreline are going to be exposed to a super, super hypertonic solution. So what they have to do usually is build a pipeline way out into the ocean to discharge it, discharge this super salty brine far out into the open. Good. So please think about it. These are some of the applications of these things that we have been talking about in class. And it's really cool to be able to use it and understand it. Good. So water potential, pressure, pressure, solute, application in real life with uh, reverse osmosis. And I want to give you one more example from the food industry with Twinkies. So, I use Twinkies because they are an iconic and classic treat that everybody makes fun of, but they are very well designed like most of the other things that we're going to see like this. So what is a Twinkie? A Twinkie, you have uh, a cake, a layer of cake, and in between the cake, inside you have a cream filled. So if I can make a drawing here, so you have cake, so I have cake, I have cake, and in the middle here, I have the cream fill. Now, going back to water potential, please remember an important thing here. Water potential, if we ignore pressure, the only thing that you have is solute potential, and we know the equation to calculate solute potential mathematically, minus I C R T. This is temperature, this is a constant, this is ionization constant, Please notice that the thing that you can always manipulate is the concentration of solutes. So, what is the water potential of pure water? If you just have pure distilled water, that has a water potential of zero. If you start adding solutes to your water, the more bigger this number gets, the more negative this gets. So increase this number and you get an even more negative number. So the more solutes, more solutes that you add, here are the solutes, the water potential gets more negative, which really represents a smaller number more negative, a smaller number. So please keep that in mind, that when you add this, you can regulate. So I want to go back to the Twinkie. So here you have a Twinkie, and you know that inside is cream filled, and if you have the Twinkie, outside is just a nice dry dough, not dough, cake, just like all cakes, mostly flour. And inside is the creamy stuff, very creamy, very moist, creamy stuff. Now, if you think about water potential right now, what has more water? Does the cake have more water or the cream? The cream has more water because the cream is kind of moist and cake is always kind of dry. It's supposed to be that way. And it's the contrast that appeals to our taste buds. So here we go. This dry has low water potential, or high, low, 
very low, very negative. Dry, very low water potential, very negative. Moist, that means you have more water. So it has a high water potential. So in a system like this with more water, what is the water going to do? If you leave it alone, water is going to move from high water potential, water is going to move to the cake. And when water moves to the cake, the cake gets soggy. And nobody likes soggy cake, unless it's a tres leches dessert, but that's the exception. But nobody really likes, and consumers don't like soggy cake. They like their, you know, right consistency. So the question is, how do they do this? How do they manage to have anything that is moist and watery here, maintaining the cake part kind of dry? And the answer is water potential. What they have to do is make sure that the water potential of the cake and the filling make sure that the water potential of all parts is exactly the same. This is low water potential, this is low water potential. How can they decrease the water potential of the filling? How can they make it lower, more negative? The only way that you can make the water potential lower, more negative, is to add more solutes. So you are going to add more solutes to the cream. And the preferred solute, in this case, is going to be sugar. Basically, what the food industry does is that they increase the concentration of solutes so that the water potential evens out. And then, when the water potential is the same, water does not move. And you are able to keep your moist, creamy center and your drier, cakey-like on the outside. Pure water potential business. Cool, eh? The same thing applies to pies. You make a pie. Let's make a pie. Ready? Pie. Nice crust. Nice crust. And then you put the filling inside. Filling, filling, filling. When I make my pies, as soon as we get it out of the oven, my crust gets totally soggy and my pies start falling apart. But I like them that way. When you buy a pie, the crust never gets soggy. Have you ever noticed that? In pies that you buy in the stores, the crust does not get soggy. But when you make a pie at home, it does get soggy usually. What is the secret of the stores to prevent the crust from getting too soggy? The secret is they have to increase the amount of solutes in the filling to make sure that water does not migrate, to make sure that the water potential in the filling is the same as the water potential is in the crust. So you can apply this to anything that has this interface. Think of burritos. You make burritos at home, and by the time you get half the way through, the tortilla is falling apart. You get burritos at the store, and it never falls apart. In part because the one that you buy in the store, they put a lot more salt to prevent the migration of water toward the tortilla. Now, apply this knowledge to anything that has this water cakey-like interface you're going to find exactly the same situation. That's why processed foods are very high in sugar and very high in salt. Part of the reason is because they need to do it that way to maintain the integrity of the multiple layers, the different textures of things that they put in there. Right? So that is a nice way to do it.
So that was all about water potential, reverse osmosis. I wanted to give you all that. And uh, now I want to finish with a couple of other practical applications uh, very quickly. So you can stop this whenever you want to if you get too overwhelmed. I'm just going fast because I have no questions, no audience right here. So let's go to another topic of conversation and is, have you ever been to the hospital? I hope not. But if you have, or if they have ever had to put you down in the hospital for a reason, you might have been hooked to an IV, IV, intravenous fluid. And they put this bag that has the IV fluid hanging and is connected to you and you sit there and do whatever. Now, what is in this bag? This bag has IV fluid, and if you read at what it says here, it says 0.9% sodium chloride. IV 0.9% sodium chloride. This is what they put in you. So you are dehydrated, you go to a hospital, they add this. You are losing blood, you go to a hospital, they put this to bring your fluids back to normal, at least to uh, get your blood back to normal. Why 0.9%? 0.9%. That means 0.9 grams of salt in 100 ml of water. Don't forget how much seawater was. Seawater was 3.5. The reason they do this is because this solution is isotonic to your cells, to your blood right there. It's an isotonic solution. So they put it in and your red blood cells, what happens to your red blood cells if they are in an isotonic solution? Nothing. They stay the same size. So pretend. What would happen if instead of the 0.9% sodium chloride solution on the IV, I would add regular water, water straight to the vein? What if I add water? What would happen to your red blood cells? They would get bigger until they would blow up because just pure water could be a hypotonic solution. What happens if I put salty water inside you? Just grab some sea water and stick it in you. What would happen to your red blood cell if I add sea water? If I add sea water, your red blood cell will totally shrivel and get very tiny and it will not be able to function at all. So little things that you have to pay attention to. These numbers mean something, so please remember these numbers. An IV solution, 0.9%, that's how salty we are. If you taste yourself, that's pretty much an indication of 0.9% sodium chloride, unless you're sweating a lot, that's it. But that's our saltiness, and this is an isotonic solution to ourselves. So, there you have it. Good. Now, before we go any further, I want to show you a couple of little videos that I have here that are going to enhance a lot of the stuff that we have talked about. So be patient. I'm going to turn the lights off and on. And the first video is of, I know it's a hodgepodge of things today, but I want to get everything to you uh, on a timely fashion. So I'm going to turn the lights off. And the first video that I want to show you is of uh, aquaporin. These are the proteins. These are the proteins. I don't know how well it's going to be in the video. It's pretty good. If you look at this, and these are going to be online too, these are phospholipids. Phospholipids, phospholipids. These reddish things are water molecules. And right here in the middle, in kind of bluish is an aquaporin that you can see there. It's an aquaporin. Let me, there you go, much better. 
There you go. That's an aquaporin. And as you can see, they are all moving because the membrane is very fluid and flexible. And the water is moving through only through the aquaporin, this bluish protein that is here. You can see the red dots moving. Nothing is going through the phospholipid bilayer because this is totally hydrophobic. I thought that you would be interested in seeing kind of what really the cell membrane looks like. And that's really cool. The second thing I wanted to show you here is Elodia. In the lab, it didn't work very well, so I want to show you what a turgid, full of water Elodia looks like. Check out the chloroplasts circulating around. They are moving, and notice that they are mostly on the edges because the middle of the cell is, has that central vacuum full of water that basically pushes the cytoplasm just to the outside. So pretty cool to see the chloroplasts just moving. The other specks moving are protista, other things that are in the water. So really cool. So that's normal, happy Elodia in a very turgid state. And now what I'm going to show you is the same Elodia, but we're going to put a sodium chloride solution. So pay attention. Look at the chloroplast, look at the cytoplasm, how it's kind of shrinking. Everything is kind of coming, getting smaller. Just be patient. This is a time photography, the same thing that you can do now with your iPhone, time lapse. But check it out, it's smaller. You can see the membrane just shrinking there, and all the chloroplasts, instead of being all over, now they are compacted. It's really, really cool. Now, this is about to get to the end. When it gets to the end, it's going to start again. So look at the contrast between totally shriveled up, totally flaccid, almost plasmolysis. And we're going to go back to the beginning in a minute. Yep. Check it out. This is how everything started. And now it's shrinking again. So when you see this, it's like, wow, this is really cool. This is what I was supposed to show you in the lab, and it didn't work quite well for us. Good. So that's the other part that we talked today in class very shortly. Right. The next thing, so that's number, I lost track of the numbers. So what I want to show you now is one more little thing. Again, when we talked about transport, we talked about insulin and glucose regulation, and we talked a little bit about how glucose moves from the blood to your cells. And just to remind you a little bit of the picture, if I have a, let's see, let's make the blood first. If I have my blood, that's blood, a blood vessel. And inside the blood vessel, I have glucose molecules. So let's pretend that we just ate lunch not too long ago. You had a lot of carbohydrates. And in your intestine, you broke all those carbohydrates into glucose. And all that glucose got loaded into your blood. So you have this humongous amount of glucose in your blood. We know that you have a certain level that is normal. When your glucose goes up above normal, your pancreas is going to release insulin, and insulin is going to help lower the blood. Now, in class, I showed you the blood, and in class, we, draw, we drew a, this, or I had the slide in a PowerPoint. This is a body cell, any of your body cells. And I show you that in your body cell, you have something called an insulin receptor. That's a protein in the membrane. And you also have another protein called the GLUT, glucose transporter. 
So you just ate, you have all this sugar in your blood, your sugar is way up, up, up. So the first thing that happens to your pancreas notices the high sugar and your pancreas releases insulin. There are these blue specks that I'm putting here. Releases insulin. The insulin gets out of your blood, insulin, and the insulin attaches to the insulin receptor in your body cells. The insulin attaches, the receptor acknowledges, oh yeah, I got insulin. And the receptor is gonna send a signal, is gonna send a signal to this glut protein that is in the membrane. When this glut protein in the membrane gets the message, gets the signal, the signal really says, what is the signal? The, se the signal says, open. So when the glut gets the signal, glut is gonna open up, the protein is gonna change shape, it's gonna open up, open up, open sesame, and what is gonna happen now all this glucose that is in your blood is going to be able to go into the cells. All this glucose from the blood is going to go into the cells. So now all those glucose molecules are into the cells. So, when insulin is released by the pancreas, talks to the insulin receptor, the insulin receptor sends a signal to the glut protein. Basically, we are talking about facilitated diffusion here. Facilitated diffusion. And sugar, all of your glucose can get into the cells. And when this glucose gets into the cells, the amount of glucose in the blood goes down and you reach the normal levels that you're supposed to do. That's what insulin does. And if you were in class today, I show you I have little bottles of insulin that everybody got to see. This is real insulin. So we have insulin to look at. Good. However, this is not the whole story. And today I wanted you to get the whole, whole story because it makes more sense and is applying what we have been studying. So I'm going to show you right now the whole story so you can get it totally right. So I'm going to erase all this and I'm going to show you the whole story because you're missing half of the story. So we have right here, I passed this in class and I'm going to put it, you have it, is feedback, maintaining homeostasis, the regulation of blood sugar. And your blood sugar is supposed to be about 90 milligrams per 100 ml. This is normal blood sugar. So what happens right after you eat, right after you eat, the glucose in your blood goes up, you have high sugar, so who's gonna notice that you have high sugar right now? Your pancreas. And your pancreas is gonna release insulin. As soon as the insulin is released, the insulin is gonna talk to the receptors in your cells and the glut protein is gonna open up. This is what makes glut open up. Glut opens. And basically the glucose goes into your body cells and then lowers the glucose in the blood. In addition to that, the liver also gets this message. So all the cells in the liver open up, lots of glucose goes in, and as you know, in your liver, all the glucose through dehydration reaction is joined together to form glycogen. What else does insulin do? It tells your brain, it's gonna signal your brain that says, hey, you're not hungry anymore, stop eating. Unfortunately, we don't listen very well to those signals anymore. 
full plate in front of you, you eat it without thinking. So this is what happens when you have high blood sugar. So after we eat, this is what goes on. And that brings the amount of sugar in our blood to the normal levels, so we have normal concentrations of sugar. Now, I want you to think of something different now. You haven't eaten all day, or for many, many, many hours. And you have been thinking, working, going to class, or working out. You have been doing a lot of things without food. What happens to the amount of sugar in your blood? When you have not eaten and you have been very active, your cells are using the glucose that they have inside, plus everything else, and the amount of sugar circulating starts going down. And that's when you feel very exhausted because you don't have any energy. And if it's really bad, if your sugar drops too much, you can even pass out. So your body is very smart. It's trying to maintain homeostasis. So what is your body going to do? Ah. So when your sugar level goes too low, because you have not eaten, or you have been using your brain or your body too much, and your sugar is low, hello, your pancreas notices again, but this time it releases a hormone called glucagon. I think it's, there you go, glucagon. Please do not confuse glucagon with glycogen, glucose, glycerol, all those words are gonna sound the same, so please keep them straight. Glucagon is a hormone produced by the pancreas when your sugar is low. And guess what glucagon does in your body? Glucagon tells all your liver cells to release the glycogen, to break down the glycogen and release the glucose. So your glucagon, when it gets to the liver, goes there and all those long chains of glucose that you have as glycogen, the liver goes and one by one breaks all the glycogen in glucose molecules and all the glucose goes to your body. And then you are allowed to have normal levels of glucose in your blood to allow your body to work properly. So this is very important that you understand because it's kind of using everything that we have uh, studied in this first half. All these basic molecules making glycogen, all these basic molecules falling apart into glucose, transport through your cells, everything is totally applied in this process of how your body maintains the homeostasis of glucose. So I hope this helps. I hope it helps you understand your body, and that's it. Happy eating from now on. <laughs>